Aloha, everyone. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham, and this is The Economy and You here at Think Tech Hawaii. Um, today, we're going to be interviewing and discussing uh, candidacy uh, with Patrick Shea, who's running for a house seat. And it's, hi, Patrick, uh, which house seat is it? It's the house seat District 49. District 49. Kaneohe, Mauna Willi, and Olomana. Okay, and then who currently sits in that seat? The incumbent's name is Mr. Ito. Mr. Ito, okay, yes, and he's been there quite a while. I think he's been there a couple of decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's sort of a, uh, it's a tough fight when you're going after somebody who's been an incumbent that long. Yes, it's a bit of an uphill battle. Yeah. Uh, he's an established candidate and he's a, he's a nice, kind person. Yes. So he's popular. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But you know, sometimes we need to bring new energy into the legislature. So well, yeah. one has to appreciate that. And, and that's exactly what's compelling me to run. I mean, I saw a couple of things happen in the legislature this year, a couple of bills that I thought were really bad. And um, I would like to prevent those sorts of bills from coming up again. Well, I'm worried that you only saw a couple of them. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, how much time do we have? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've seen the bills that come through the legislature, and it makes for an interesting read, you know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you've got nothing better to do and sit down and read bills for a couple of days, um, you'd just be amazed at some of the stuff that comes across. And I don't think that we're engaged enough as a community or as a people yeah. to really know enough about these things. And so sometimes we don't, we don't know the issues well enough, mm -hmm. so I'd like to you know, get those things out there. Yeah, and one of the things that I think is challenging, and I'm, I'm going to just put that out there for anybody at the legislature that might be listening, is the search engine for looking up bills needs to be revisited. It's very difficult to work with to find the bills that you're looking for. So if any of the programmers that are out there listening to this program, I just want to give you a clue. We'd really like to see that improved. Uh, but anyway, thank you for, um, for coming on Think Tech Hawaii. And, uh, um, so, what are some of the concerns we talked about earlier before the show was something called the public trust doctrine. And I think this is one of those issues that sort of resonates with you. Uh, yeah. Maybe you could give people a little bit of a background on what this, how this sort of uh, became an issue for you. Sure. Um, the Hawaii State Constitution is really unique. It has a provision called the public trust doctrine, mm -hmm. which says that all public natural resources are to be held in trust by the state for the benefit of the people. Natural resources. Natural resources. So does this mean that oil, if we were to discover oil, would not belong to us, it would belong to the state? If the oil were on state land, or under state land, then it would be, you know, public. Okay. In the same way that water is. Okay. And one of the things that really got me excited about making a run for this House seat was the passage of House Bill 2501 which is the bill that allowed a corporate entity to divert water on Maui uh, even though it admitted that it had no need for the water anymore. So it wasn't to serve the public good? Exactly right. Ah, okay. In there fact, it doesn't <coughs> serve the public. I thought that by passing 2501 and allowing the corporate entity to continue to divert water even when there was no need for it and even when they admit that th that diversion will not serve the public uh, I, I thought the legislature violated the public trust doctrine. Uh -huh. Now, does it serve them? Does it A and B? I don't think that it does, except to the extent that it might preserve a possibility of using these resources later. But they have no current need for the water. Ah. And so that's why I think that we, we need to really take a look at that and, and what we've done. If you look at trust law generally, mm -hmm. a person that serves as a trustee uh, has a fiduciary responsibility to the beneficiaries of that trust. And then they're, they're supposed to operate as a prudent man, right? There's something called a prudent man rule? Yes, that is in, in trust law. Yeah. Sure. Um, but more importantly, I think they have to uh, behave in a way that only benefits the beneficiaries. The trustee should not be allowed to do anything that benefits itself or a person that's not a beneficiary. Mm -hmm. So. To analogize that to the public trust doctrine, we are the beneficiaries as citizens of the state of Hawaii of this public trust. And to the extent that that water is being diverted and we're not able to benefit from it, the state, I think, owes us a duty and has violated that duty by allowing a corporate entity to, uh, to have that asset instead of but the it, people. But is this the first time that's happened? I mean, hasn't this happened before? I think it has, and I think it happens often, but this just seemed to me to be the most blatant recent example. And it, like I said, it really got me excited about this run. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Now, what would you suppose would be the resolution, the way to resolve this, and, and, and what, what would, should have been the solution that should have been put before the legislature? 
Uh, I think that they should have voted that down. I think it should be repealed. I think that the holdover tenancy rights that the corporate entity has as to that water um, should not be enforced or enforceable. And I think we should allow uh, Native Hawaiian kalo farmers and other organic farmers, individual mm -hmm. people that would like to use this water to right. farm, we should give them an opportunity to do that since it's just kind of being wasted since... Is it just running back into the ocean then? Yeah, well, it's, it's diverted to, to A and B's areas, whereas if... It's, in other words, it's not flowing from Mauka to Makai right. the way it naturally would. So right. if we would allow it to do that, then people along that, pa that path would have the opportunity to farm. Are there people in that area that would be, I mean, that would be able to do farming, I guess? There are. And, really, and I mean, does, the, does, the, does that entity really exist? I mean, are there people there that definitely would have benefited from that water flow? I think there are. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Yeah. Uh, the, the answer is yes. Okay. And these are the folks that were protesting the 2501, and, and uh, it was in the news quite a bit a, a uh -huh. couple of months ago. So, yes. so clearly there are people who now are, are losing out because of this. And so to, but one of the challenges, of course, when you have a large corporation, they bring a lot of influence to the table. True. Yeah. And uh, so uh, now, you know, and then I guess when you have something like this, the question is, uh, does this detract from our ability to bring in other investors or bring more investors into Hawaii? You know, one of the challenges that we've talked about with, um, in, in Hawaii is we have a shortage of housing. We need to do, do more to take care of our kapuna, right? Um, are we doing the things that we need to be doing to attract investment? And yeah. is this, is the, would this be, you know, rolling back this kind of a law, would this be helpful or harmful to that cause? You know, I, I don't think it would have an effect on that cause because this law that was passed is so specific that it only benefits a single corporation. Mm -hmm. It's not a, yet, it hasn't been generalized to benefit all corporations at the expense of individuals. Uh -huh. uh, at this point, it's just that one company. Okay. So yeah, I, I don't think that this really has an effect on that, but you're right. There are things that we can do that we ought to do to inspire uh, investment and, and business. Uh -huh. You know, um, one of the reasons, another reason I'm running for office is that I think it's just so hard for people to make a living in Hawaii now. It's tough. You know? It is tough. Right. I mean, you know, it feels like you're on this sort of treadmill. And no matter how hard, how hard you run on this treadmill, you always feel like you're slipping back. You're slipping back. You're not gaining ground. You're slipping back. Indeed, you are slipping back. Yes. Um, you know, when I was growing up, my dad worked at Pearl Harbor. My mom was a school secretary. Mm -hmm. You know, they were hourly wage earners. They could afford to buy a house. They could afford to send me to college. Mm -hmm. and I just don't think that we're in a position where you know, people that would be similarly situated today would be able to do both of those things. Um, and then we have this brain drain issue where yes. you send folks, you send your kids away to college, and the job that they can afford to have mm -hmm. is on the mainland. Yeah. And so I'm running for office because I don't want to sit across the kitchen table for my two boys and have them explain to me why they won't be coming back to Hawaii. Well, I've already had that conversation with my daughters. Yeah, I have one in Washington, D.C., one in Seattle, Washington, and that's where they've, they've uh, hung their hats to, to make a living. Uh, so, th because financial security is an imperative. Yeah. And one of the challenges, of course, is being able to come back to Hawaii after you've got an education, find a well-paying job, and be able to afford the, the cost of living, to be able to buy a home. You know, these are tough, it's tough. Right. Um, we're not building enough housing units to meet, meet the, our current demand. And I guess maybe this is just a paradox of being in Hawaii. Maybe it's a paradox. Maybe the challenge is because we're in a beautiful place, we have a limited amount of land, we're always going to have, maybe we're always going to have this problem. Or is there something we can do? You know, we've had this problem for a long time. Yeah. It seems worse now, but maybe that's just because it's the way I'm seeing it. Uh -huh. But, you know, our, our, our islands are beautiful. Everybody would like to have a house here. So we compete on a global scale for real estate. But our jobs are all tied to the service industry. Mm -hmm. And so the wages don't keep pace with the value of our property. There's no way they keep pace. Absolutely not. Not possible. No. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we talked a little bit before we got started here about mm -hmm. we're going to need 65,000 new housing units just to keep pace with the demand. Mm -hmm. And development's going to be necessary. We're going to have to provide that. But we need to be able to provide it in a thoughtful and a conscious way. Mm -hmm. To the extent that we can preserve natural open space, we need to do that. That's right. I agree with that, yeah. And, and we need to, you know, 
I'm talking about my kids a lot, but you know, we need to be able to say, we want you to be here. We want you to have Aloha, opportunities my name professionally is Justine here. We want you to have an opportunity mm -hmm. to buy a home here. But we also need to make sure that uh, the Hawaii that we leave them is as good as or better than the Hawaii that we got to have. And that means taking care of the public open spaces and being thoughtful about the way we develop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. You know, um, the, the, you need park space because I think park space is what makes an, an area a community. Right. You know, where people can come together and do things and socialize and have that sort of um, uh, group consciousness. Uh, about what's going on in their community. Um, and, and uh, you know, we are going to be changing, though. I mean, I think cars, cars are definitely going, you know, we've, we've flooded the roads with vehicles. I don't think we can keep doing that at the pace that we've done it. Um, we are going to have to find alternative solutions. Um, the rail sort of certainly presents some unique challenges. One, because it's a huge investment. And the question is, at the end of the day, you know, is it going to pay off for us? I don't know the answer to that yeah. question. I mean, yeah. um, it's horribly over budget. Yes, it's really a city and county issue. So you know, my seat isn't you know right. won't have control over making decisions about that. But on the budgetary side, you know, there is some influence that the state legislature can have, and mm -hmm. you know, I think it's important to make sure that it doesn't continue to go over budget uh, the way it has. It's just yeah, yeah. Do we need to find more creative solutions to our traffic? I mean, is this we got to keep working? To develop, you know, I, I just saw on TV recently um, this new bus that they have in China that actually drives over the top of cars. That thing is amazing. That's an amazing vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, well, if you're going to stop the rail at Middle Street, maybe you need to have these overhead buses come down Nimitz. You know, come down Nimitz. You'd have to reconfigure Nimitz. But the good news, there aren't any sort of over overhead things going on on Nimitz Highway, so you could, I guess, potentially have overhead buses going on there. You know? Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be the, probably the optimal solution, but um, considering where we're at, we can't keep growing with more cars. Yeah, the first, I saw what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and yeah, And when I first saw that, I thought, gosh, if we had only known about this a few years earlier, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. we could have implemented it. <laughs> because <laughs> it doesn't look very expensive by comparison. Yeah, by comparison. Yeah, well, you, I mean, you have to sort of make some sort of tracks or something for the wheels to go in. But right. clearly, um, if, I, if I'm not having to sit in my car and I can ride on a bus that's going over the traffic, that sounds like a pretty cool solution. Yeah, it does to me too. Yeah, yeah, I, I really like that. Yeah. Um, so, but let's also talk a little bit about, um, um, we're, well, we're going to take a commercial break. Let's sure. do this. Let's take a commercial break and we'll come back and let's talk about, um, also, let's talk a little bit about our Kapuna. Let's do that. You know, that's an issue uh, dear to my heart as well. So we'll take a commercial break. We'll be right back. I'm Chris Leatham and this is The Economy News. And we'll see you in just a second. Aloha, this is Maria Mera, and I'm here to invite you to my bilingual show, Viva Hawaii on Think Tech Hawaii, every other Monday at 3 p.m. We're here to inform, motivate, and entertain you. Join us. Hola, soy Maria Mera, y estoy aquí para invitaros a mi show bilingüe, Viva Hawaii en Think Tech Hawaii, cada dos lunes a las 3 de la tarde. Estamos aquí para informaros, motivaros, y entreteneros. Apuntaros. Hi. I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what is likeable about science. We bring on scientists of all ilk, astronomers, physicists, chemists, biologists, ecologists, and they talk about their work, and more importantly, they talk about why you should talk about their work, why you should think about their work, why you should like their work. I help them bring out why their work is understandable, why it's meaningful, why people should care about it, why people should support science. We have a good time. We talk about current uh, events of interest. We talk about uh, historical events sometimes. We dig deep into their research, why they do, what the joys and delights and frustrations of their work are. And in all, we, we show a, a real world of science, a real world of likable science. I hope you'll join us every Friday at 2 p.m. Well, hello, everybody. We're back. I'm Chris Leatham. This is The Economy and You, and today's guest is Patrick Shea. Patrick is running for a house seat 49 uh, and uh, in the Kaneohe area. That's right. Kaneohe. And, well, okay, so we were talking a little bit about um, uh, the, some of the challenges that we face here. We have a couple of issues, of course, housing and taking care of our kapuna. Yeah. Um, these are issues that I ran on my campaign as, as well because I think these are issues that we just can no longer ignore. Homelessness is just 
got, got become absurd. I mean, yeah. homeless. I, it, it, when I drive around, I can count how many homeless people I can see between a, the time I get off the freeway till I get to my uh, my condo. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I know I, I I see five or six homeless people every night. Right. You know, so. Um, where, where do we go with this, with, with housing? What can we do well, to actually get more housing developed? In your well, here's how I know we have the need. Yeah. When I've been walking around the district, knocking on doors, trying to introduce myself to voters, I'll knock on a door and you'll see a lady in her 70s who's caring for another lady in her 90s and also a child that's less than 10 years old. Mm -hmm. The generation that's missing from that at that time is at work. Yes. Uh, so we have... The homeless that you're talking about that you see, and then there are what people are calling the hidden homeless, which are, you know, the people that are just crammed into their childhood homes because the opportunity, like we were talking about earlier, to own a home, the financial opportunity is not there, and mm -hmm. financial security doesn't exist for a lot of people. So, um, on the issue of Kupuna Care, you know, I think we really have to take a look at it because we value aging in place. Mm -hmm. We value our, you know, close families. And it kind of works for us, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of pressure on what's usually the one of the siblings that has to care for the parent or grandparent. And there's just not enough resources to make that, you know, possible. Yeah. Um, this, this, is a, this is a real challenge, you know, because as you said, you'll have, you'll have people, older people taking care of other older people. Yeah. You know, maybe somebody else has dementia or um, early stages of Alzheimer's or you'll have, and then you also you'll have the, the children. But, you know, one of the things about Hawaii is that we have a lot of that sort of Asian culture where we have extended families. Yes. Uh, which is great. I think it's a wonderful thing. But on the other hand, it does also create a lot of pressure on those that are still working and having to support everybody. You know, are we doing enough? That pressure is the stress of caring for a person that's difficult to care for. Mm -hmm. uh, decreased productivity because you can't work as much. Right. So your finances are affected because you're not as productive and you can't work as much. And, you know, at some point, the road starts to point to finding another place for our kupuna to live. Uh, we had our mo my mother-in-law living with us for years. She had Alzheimer's, early onset Alzheimer's. And she had the foresight to invest in long-term care. Mm. Very few people have that foresight. It was the best investment she'd ever made because without that, I don't know how we would have made things work for her. She needed round-the-clock care at the end, and um, I think people that haven't thought about that during their mm -hmm. uh, cognizant lives. That's right, right. And long-term care choice. is a really hard thing to sell. Right. Uh, you know, people aren't like, you know, it's like trying to sell somebody a funeral plan. You know, hey, you know, I'll let somebody else take care of that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we're not always good about making sure that we're taking care of our own personal needs. Uh, and maybe there's a life lesson to be learned in that uh, as well. But, you know, do we, but a lot of people, you know, long-term care, if you wait too long, it gets really expensive. It becomes impossible. Yeah, people can, then can't af afford to, to buy it. It's kind of right. like life insurance, you know, you, you got to buy it when you don't need it. Yeah, yeah. and you never want to use it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and so when you have a, a you know, a, parent or grandparent that's elderly that needs to be cared for at mm -hmm. home. Um, you have maybe Medicare, which will help pay for a doctor visit or something like that, but you don't have the types of um, funding available for as easily mm -hmm. for things like transportation, yeah. um, someone to come into the house and clean, uh, some respite care for the, um, the person who's, who's doing the, the you know, the day-to-day -day work of caring for the kupuna. That's right. You know, they need a break, you know. Cause, right. You know, you, taking care of somebody like that, that's an awful lot of stress. I, I, I can just imagine some of these folks, I, I, I can't believe they don't lose their minds, I mean, with the amount of time that, and energy it takes for them to take care of somebody. Sure, and I think that we can provide support to them to help them effectively do their job and know when to take care of themselves so that they can continue to effectively mm -hmm. care for our kupuna. And the other thing I'd like to talk about that you brought up earlier about community. Yes. Our kapuna feel isolated, I think, when they're stuck at home. And we need to make sure that the state is providing a way for them to connect with their community. I think that's the most important aspect of aging mm -hmm. in place in a dignified way. Yeah. You have and to maintain your connection. Now, is there a way to incorporate, say, churches? One, churches have space. Two, they have a lot of people that are sort of volunteer-minded. Is there a way to incorporate 
church. Is there anything wrong with that? I mean, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. No. Maybe we, we need to do more to encourage uh, and provide opportunities for our churches. Sure. Uh, to be a part of that solution, as well as you know, I, I, I kind of like the idea of kids being able to go to daycare uh, through the churches. I don't necessarily think that it, it's about indoctrination. They have facilities. They have people that are you know generally capable. Uh, it's just it seems like that maybe we need to you know to exploit that, those resources. I think that they would welcome. Yeah. Al Kupuna into any programs that they that they could put on. Yeah, I think that that's that's uh, that that's you know where, wherever we can find resources. Sure, and it doesn't just have to be churches. There are that's other right. cultural clubs uh, mm -hmm. and other you know important cultural hubs yes. that could be used to the same end. Yes. yes, and I think that it would enrich the lives of Al Kupuna immeasurably. I have to agree. I have to agree. So. Um, you're sort of, is this your first time to run for office? It is. It is first time. So how are you finding this? This is, a, this is a really interesting experience when you run for office for the first time. It's been a very meaningful experience so far because it's really been an invitation to myself to really look uh, at who I am and what's driving me. Where do these values come from? What is my life experience that's making me feel that I think I could do better because it's a, it's a big bite to step up and run for office. Yeah, yeah. it is. What's, what's motivating you to get up every day and do this? I think just, just what we talked about before, which is making sure that my kids have a good Hawaii and have opportunities and will be able to retire here. And we'll be able to raise families here. Yeah. I mean, that's really it for me. And, you know, the other aspect of this run that's been really meaningful to me has been really thinking through how my values are played out and am I, am I really living those values you know mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I were having a discussion recently about um, slave labor you don't think about it because you don't see it but sometimes that inexpensive t-shirt that you bought at one of the big stores mm -hmm. it's inexpensive because they're able to pass along the savings that come from using slave labor to you and I, you really have to you know think about these things in a way that you might not if you're not running for public office. You have to think about how your values play out in your life and whether or not you're really living your values. We can be blind to these things or we could really have an awakening. And for me, it's been a tremendous amount of personal growth because it's helped me think these things through. Well, you know, I always want to encourage people uh, when, they, when they see somebody like you running for office <clears throat> to step up and come to the ballot box, um, vote, uh, either through the mail or, or vote uh, and show up on election day and vote. I think a lot of people don't necessarily, who, who don't vote, don't really appreciate the amount of sacrifice that a candidate makes and what they're really giving up when they run for office. And that you're, you're trying to realize um, your values and the values of your community. Um, and I think it, it, it's, a, it's such a huge sacrifice that um, it feels to me it's a bit of a disservice when people don't step up and vote. Uh, I so I'd, I think really, I'd really like to see that. Yeah, I think we have a duty to mm -hmm. operate this democracy. Um, we need to teach our kids in school how they get involved in our democracy. They need to understand in a way that I think past generations have uh, the responsibility to vote. And sometimes I'll be knocking on doors in the district and people will just be so frustrated and they'll say, I don't vote. And you say, well, no, I understand your frustration, but I think this is what the first step in trying to get, you know, change things. No, I won't do it. I'm mm. not interested in voting. And it's, it's kind of heartbreaking. Yeah, it, it's, it's tough because, you know, what I, what, I, what I say is, you know, voting is how you get rat, rid of people or fire somebody who isn't serving your interests, right. you know. So uh, when you exercise your vote, yes, you're saying, I'm for this person, but when you say, when you vote, in opposition to somebody, you're saying, you know, you haven't lived up to the expectations uh, of the trust that we've given you and what we, uh, the needs of, what I feel are the needs of uh, my community. So I think voting is, is really an, an imperative. Um, and Hawaii, of course, has had some of the lowest voter turnout in the nation. Yeah. So I sort of talk about this because it's really important uh, that we participate in democracy. Right. You know, you went to law school, I did. Um, which uh, took quite a sacrifice as well. I'm still paying for it. Yeah, you're still paying for yes. it. 
<laughs> Every month. <laughs> the student loans just sort of go on forever. It's been know? 18 years and I'm still paying <laughs> still them. Still paying the student loans. <laughs> oh and it's so much more expensive now than it was when I went. Yeah, I mean, I think it would crazy. probably cost twice as much. And yeah. I can't imagine the debt load that people that are graduating from law school now have. Mm -hmm. And then to have to work in Honolulu and, I don't know, it's easier to go someplace else and have a high paycheck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, maybe one of the things that we also need to consider is not only, you know, just the short term, but we also have to think strategically. Um, if we're going to grow Hawaii in a way uh, that provides well-paying jobs uh, far into the future, uh, I think we have to have a strategic plan for, for growth and for bringing jobs to Hawaii. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, are we having that discussion at the legislature these days? I think we're not capitalizing enough on our university system. I don't think that we're um, creating opportunities through our university, mm -hmm. uh, which could be sort of a, a bridge to a career in Hawaii. I mean, if we could figure out how, I mean, internships, not limited to that, mm -hmm. but... And apprenticeships. Apprenticeships, yes. Yeah, I mean, it, you don't have to be in, in college to... To learn something on the job through an apprenticeship and so yeah if we could figure out ways to build bridges among trade schools and the university or the community colleges to actual jobs mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we'll be that would go a long way to helping our economic situation okay well that's I think you're, you're on the right track so I really want to appreciate uh, uh, say how much I appreciate you coming on the show today is there any way if people wanted to support your candidacy how could they reach out to you What's the best way for them to contact you? Probably the best thing to do is to go to friendsofpatrickshea.com. Uh, you can look on Facebook, um, uh, Patrick K. Shea, or I guess it's Friends of Patrick K. Shea. Um, okay. But anyway, Patrick K. Pat, friends, so sorry, friendsofpatrickshea.com. Friendsofpatrickshea.com. That's it. And that's how they'll find you. Yes. Okay, well, it's very good to have you on the show. Good luck with your candidacy, and I hope we, we'll see you out there. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much for being on the show. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Chris Letham. Thank you for watching today's show, and we'll see you next week, Wednesday, 3 o'clock, right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha.